Hey guys, this is Garrett Wong, also known as Ensign Harry Kim from Star Trek Voyager, and you're watching Astronomy Live. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Hello and welcome to Astronomy Live. Tonight we're going to be imaging Stefan's Quintet. This is actually revisiting this uh, cluster of galaxies. Because just before James Webb Space Telescope released a picture of this cluster, uh, I did some imaging on it. But we're going to revisit this here tonight and uh, see what we can do with it. I'm actually already not super happy with the focus, which is surprising because I just focused the telescope. But we'll fix it. And I uh, hope you guys enjoy the show. So come along and let's do some deep space imaging. Lots of hot pixels, yes. But that's not so. Uh, what's concerning me so right now. It's more the bloatedness of the stars. I'm not super thrilled with that. I'm a little surprised. So I'm going to actually stop the dark frame. And stop the autoguider for a second. We're going to move over to a nearby bright star and refocus. And then we will reposition the telescope back on these galaxies. So, there's a magnitude 3 star not very far from here. I'm gonna plug in the coordinates. Turn off auto save for a second. We're going to take a one second exposure. And we're just going to see, first of all, where it put the star. Yeah, that's what I expected. It's kind of off to the off to the right and in the upper right quadrant. It's okay, we can correct for that. I did kind of a quick and dirty alignment on polar alignment uh, tonight, but sufficient, sufficient. Alright. Trying to get this star centered up, and then we'll throw the batten off mask on and check focus.
Okay, so we've got the bat now with mask on. I'm gonna do a subframe. Go back to one by one binning and see what we see. Ah, uh, see that diffraction spike is not cutting straight through the middle, which is where we want it. Tweak the focus here. That was the wrong way. Okay, that was too much, I think. making tiny, tiny adjustments on the focuser. Trying to avoid overshooting. That's much better. Much better. I think that's good right there. So the Batonov mask creates these uh, diffraction spikes coming off the star. And we want to get that nice and symmetrical to be in focus. Here I am, hi guys. This night I've got the uh, laptop positioned in such a way that we can actually see the scope. Turn off my red headlamp there for a second. So there's the 8 inch LX200, and there is our deep space camera that's going to be taking all the pretty images tonight. Alright, so now I've taken off the Batnov mask, right? Yes. Okay, so let's go back to the galaxy. To cluster of galaxies, actually. Uh, there's my phone. I'm using Sky Safari Pro as a uh, planetarium app right now. really just hit the wrong button. Okay. Why do I keep hitting the wrong button? Fat fingering it tonight. Okay. I'm gonna try. Let's plug in the coordinates. So that we're Closer to our target. Compensating for the scope's current alignment. I don't know. This might or might not work. <laughs> Give it a shot. If it doesn't, we'll go directly to the galaxy instead and just fix it later. Okay. Yeah, I'm 
not liking what I'm seeing in terms of position here. Of course, I forgot. <laughs> I was using the wrong finder, wasn't I? Yes, yes I was. Okay, we'll try this one more time. better so I was using a uh, field of view uh, display on Sky Safari that was not actually this scope it was my refractor so I was overcompensating by quite a bit and even then I'm not, I'm not super confident that this was really the Right way to go about things. Let's go to 22. Let's just go to right click and coordinates. Just got to reposition things a little bit here so that the galaxies are centered in the view before we start the real long exposure that's really going to bring them out.
now. Let's take an auto guider picture. Get the auto guider running. Beautiful. minutes. Okay. So we're going to start taking five minute pictures again. All right, here we go. Alright, so we're back on it, hopefully this time in proper focus. It's a bit chilly out here tonight for a Floridian like me, so I'm going to put on my jacket here and hopefully warm up a little bit. So yeah, the title of this particular stream is in honor of Elisha Schaefer's hot take that uh, <laughs> he thinks that an article describing how the James Webb Space Telescope images are processed to make visible light pretty pictures means that space is fake. So, James Webb Space Telescope, as you may know, is an infrared telescope. Fantastic piece of equipment. And the images it takes are things that we, or at least in wavelengths, that we cannot see. And just like Hubble, when Hubble uses, say, narrowband filters that filter for a very specific wavelength of light, they assign that wavelength to a particular color that our eyes can perceive. And a similar process takes place for the James Webb images. Although James Webb is obviously taking images at wavelengths our eyes can't see, they are assigning it to colors we can see. That doesn't mean it's fake. And they're not just coloring it like a kid with a crayon. It's meaningful data, but it's data from wavelengths that our eyes can't see. Now, the images we're going to see here tonight are taken with an 8-inch schmidt cassegrain telescope and an S-Big ST2000XCM camera, which is a single-shot color camera. And just like any typical consumer-grade camera, its pixels are individually filtered for a particular color of light, red, green, or blue, in a repeating matrix of four pixels. So it is taking true color images, light uh, being recorded through pixels filtered for red, green, or blue, and processed into a color image that represents 
roughly what your eyes would see. Now this process normally occurs automatically in a consumer camera where it goes through a debayering process to interpolate the full resolution picture and assign the red, green, and blue pixels to their respective color channels in the image. This process is of course seamless and automatic and you don't see it happen, but it's happening on board the camera. This camera on the other hand, this SBIG ST2000, is providing raw data to the computer, just raw pixel counts of the red, green, and blue pixels. The software, sorry for the helicopter flying over, so as the software downloads this picture off the camera, it's going to process it automatically, much like a consumer camera would, but it's actually saving a raw image with just raw pixel counts how many photons were received by each pixel, filtered for red, green, or blue. And you can process that, you can reprocess that any way you like. It's up to you to do it. Um, you can take that into other software and run it through different kinds of debayering algorithms and stack the images where you're averaging multiple exposures together. So I've just taken one five minute exposure, but over the course of the evening we'll take more. And you can average these together to get rid of the noise. To maximize the signal, the, the light that is staying the same between pictures, and minimize what's changing between pictures, which is going to be random noise. Now, some of this noise signal comes from hot pixels. These red, green, and blue pixels you see here. These very intense colors indicate that a single pixel that was filtered for red, green, or blue light is providing a false on sort of signal. And we call that a hot pixel. And it looks really red, green, or blue because when the image was processed to be converted into a color picture, that pixel was known to be filtered for red, green, or blue light, and none of the neighboring pixels received any light of that, at least at that intensity. And so it shows up as a very bright color. But that's not a real signal, that's just a defective pixel. So what we do to fix that is we take a long exposure, same length as before, but with the shutter closed. And that's what the camera is doing right now. It's actually got the shutter closed on the camera and it's taking a five minute exposure at the same temperature, negative 10 Celsius tonight. It's uh, holding that temperature through um, closed loop control algorithm. So it's using thermoelectric cooling to cool the CCD Although it's chilly in Florida tonight, it's not freezing. But with the power of thermoelectric cooling, it's actually able to drop that CCD temperature all the way down to minus 10 Celsius. So, basically, it's going to hold that temperature, which is very important because the thermal component is a part of the noise signal. How hot the temperature of the CCD was at the time the picture was taken determines the no noise profile to a large extent. And so, this is one of the reasons I love this camera and love using um, an astronomical CCD camera like this, which can hold a set point temperature, because you know for a fact that your dark frame was taken at the same temperature as the camera. Uh, if you're using regular SLR, this is a real challenge, and I, I know because I've, I've battled that challenge before, where I take a whole night's worth of images and then try to just run some darks as the sun starts to come up and it starts to heat up, and the dark frames don't do a good job of compensating for the noise because they were taken at a different temperature than the main camera images. So, in about two minutes it's going to finish that dark frame and it's going to automatically subtract that from the image you're seeing here. So all those hot pixels pretty much will disappear. But again, all of these processing steps doesn't mean that the image is fake. It's a real image. We're just comp we're just um, calibrating it properly. In fact, we're doing a better job calibrating it than your typical consumer camera would do out of the box, although they are getting smarter. I mean, these days, an SLR camera will typically have a feature that you can turn on called long exposure noise compensation or something similar. Uh, my Canon T5i has it, and what it does is it does the exact same thing we're doing here. It's just doing it automatically without telling the user what it's doing. But you take a long exposure of, you know, many seconds, and it will close the shutter and take another exposure at the same length, and then when the shutter opens back up, 
you get your image, so it takes twice as long to get the image, but it's taken a dark frame for you immediately after it took the main frame, uh, the, the, the light frame. And it will do this every time you, you open and close the shutter. So it sort of does this process for you, but without really telling you in, in explicit detail what it's, what it's really doing. And your cell phone these days, if you have a smartphone that's fairly new, it probably has a night feature, a feature capable of taking long exposures at night. And what it's really doing is it's doing a lot of the same stuff I just described. It's doing long exposures, and it's also stacking those exposures. And maybe even applying even fancier algorithms to it to try to minimize the noise and, and beautify the image, as it were. But it's a real image. It's just heavily processed, but it's transparent to the user. The user doesn't, or it's an opaque process, really, to the user. The user doesn't see what's going on there. It just happens in the background, and at the end of the day, you, you get your image, and you're happy, and that's it. But it's actually a... Um, it's actually going through an extensive process. So, yeah, we've got our Galaxy Cluster here. This, again, was one of the JWST's first images that it released of Stefan's Quintet. And... These galaxies are, uh, let's see, seven, NGC 7320, 47 million light years away, 7318B, 280 million light years away. That's right, that's what I thought. There was one foreground, and the rest are 320 million light years. This is a NGC 7319. It's up here, I believe, or no, down here. So I think the big one up here, I think this fainter but big one, I think this one is probably three, 7320. I'll have to double check that with astrometry. I think that's the foreground one and the others are in the background. But don't quote me on that till I double check. So yeah, most of them are in excess of 300 million light years. Uh, whereas one of them is much, much closer, but still quite distant at 47 million light years. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up Deep Sky Stacker for a moment, and I'm going to compare the images I'm acquiring right now with the images I acquired back when um, those first JWST pictures were released. And make sure that the quality of my focus and all of that is on par with what I got before. Because what we can do is we can actually stack not only tonight's pictures, but also the previous evening's pictures. And really get a nicer image that way. But I do want to keep it a sharp eye on the focus because, you know, I focused it before and I thought it was fine and then it wasn't fine. looks pretty comparable. 
morale relatively. The camera rotation was a little bit different, but uh, that's not the end of the world. That's fine. So, keep an eye on this for a bit. And something else is happening tonight. An asteroid is flying by Earth. And a little bit later, I'll point the scope over in that direction and see if we can find it. Oh yeah, that was a medevac chopper earlier, sorry, yeah. They fly by my house fairly frequently. So it's nice to be kind of back in some sense of normalcy from Hurricane Ian, at least for me. I know that's not the case for a lot of people, though, in this area. My house lucked out in that it wasn't hit by any of the trees that fell, and there were a lot. Um, my fence wasn't so lucky, but at least... At least the house itself is okay. We had four feet of water in the road here, in this neighborhood. And unfortunately my house was higher than that, but uh, the real issue for most of my neighbors was roof damage, trees landing on their house, that kind of thing. My fence is pretty well smashed, but, uh, and I still, <laughs> still have to find a way to get couple of rather massive pine trees out of my yard, but it um, could have been a lot worse. Could have been a lot, lot worse. Mom Terra says, we lost our fence and trees too. Luckily all the trees missed the house. Glad to know your house survived too. Well, same to you, absolutely.
comes the next image. And we have a satellite transit through there. Interesting. If I can, see if I can identify which one that was. seeing whatever that was. Ooh. Unidentified satellite. At least it's not in Sky Safari's database. But Sky Safari Pro's database of satellites is definitely not exhaustive. Certainly, whatever that was, was not in the database. Could have been a classified satellite, or just a piece of random space junk. Or it could be aliens, who knows? <laughs> whatever it is, is not identified. Starlink 4178. You know, that's a good question. Could have been a Starlink satellite. And I don't know if... Did Sky Safari ever update to start really including all those? I guess it did. I know I've seen them on here. And Starlink 4178, if, uh, if that's the correct ID, it's apparently not in Sky Safari's database, so who knows, maybe you're right. A military satellite, maybe? Yeah, very well could be. At this hour and at this season, this close to the zenith, I would kind of be surprised if it was Starlink. Just because of my latitude, it, Starlink visibility is going to depend on your, your latitude, the time of year, and the location in the sky. And all those factors are sort of against it being Starlink, to be honest. We're pretty close to the zenith here. And uh, at this hour... Probably not. Probably not. Military satellite, very possible.
And with that next picture, the satellite streak goes away. Hey, Scott, how you doing? Good to see you. It's the Robinsons. Okay, I get it. <laughs> Very funny. They're still lost, you might say, in space. So it was July 9th that I last did this object. What is the small blur lower middle screen? Uh, yeah, that's uh, small blur lower middle of screen. So I think that's going to be the uh, the target itself. So yeah, we're looking at Stefan's quintet, and that's kind of the small blurry thing in the middle. There are some other galaxies throughout, though. So, let's see here. Let me take a look at their IDs for a second. Okay, so... Move my mouse cursor over here. I don't know if you guys can see the mouse cursor. But from kind of the 11 o'clock position, kind of where the mouse cursor is right now. Hopefully you can see it. That is NGC 7320 foreground. Uh, the foreground galaxy, which is 47 million light years away. And then at the sort of uh, 
one o'clock position over here. This is NGC 7317, 320 million light years away. Oh, we got a cosmic ray strike right there. That's why you see sort of this red and blue pixel lit up next to each other. Space radiation hit the camera during that exposure and actually lit up these pixels. So then we have uh, a pair of galaxies here, NGC 7318A, and I'm assuming it's A and B, 320 million light years away as well. Yeah, okay, so A is on the right, I think, and B is going to be on the left. And then we have down here NGC 7319, and this is also 320 million light years away, roughly. Now we do have some additional galaxies that are even fainter. We have this one down here. This is NGC 7320 Charlie, or C, 290 million light years away, thereabouts. And up at the top here, we have what looks like an edge on spiral, maybe. This is NGC 7320A does not even have a distance listed in Sky Safari. It's magnitude 15, though. Pretty dim. In fact, it's worth pointing out here that, I mean, every single star in this entire view is dimmer than anything you can see by eye. None of these stars are visible by eye. Brightest one is probably this one, I think. SAO 72507. And that's magnitude 9.89. It's still a couple magnitudes too dim to see, even with averted vision in a location with perfectly dark skies. And meanwhile, the quintet itself in the middle. It's comprised of galaxies that range from about magnitude 12.6 up to magnitude 14 or so. Many, many times too dim to see by eye. You really have to have a pretty powerful telescope and camera to pick them up. But they can be detected. And they are real, despite what some apparently think. The mouse is way off. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Yeah, I should have known that was going to be the case. For some reason, uh, OBS, the way it captures CCD soft window is not great. It, like, resizes it somehow in the capture. Alright, I can't use the mouse then. It's not helping anyone, I guess. Keep adding the images I have been collecting tonight to my list. 
So we can try to monitor things. Here comes the next image, as a matter of fact. Okay, it looks good. Now, uh, the asteroid we're going to pursue here in a while is 20, 2022 UC1, which is apparently passing by Earth at 1.4 times the, the distance to the moon tonight, which is not very far. And uh, should be well within the reach of this telescope, should be comparable actually in brightness to these galaxies we're looking at, but all concentrated in a single point of light. see if I can pull up currently seeing if I can pull up its coordinates on JPL Current time is going to be 2.51 universal time. Yeah, it's coming up nicely. Mm. Looks like a good candidate for tracking with NeoTracker. So I'll give that a shot got a new version of NeoTracker I've actually been working on to be able to track uh, the Orion capsule after the launch of Artemis 1. Haven't tested it in the field yet, so that'll be interesting. We'll see how it does, but I'm going to try to give it a shot and see if the new version works well. This is a good chance to really give it a, a workout in the field and uh, verify that it's working properly. Beetlejuice in there anywhere? No, definitely not. We're actually looking more towards the uh, Great Square of Pegasus. Yeah, we are technically within the borders of Pegasus right now. Draw on an overlay. Yeah, that, that would have been smart. <laughs> So, I'll just try to draw on it. Hopefully this works. So, there. There's a square around NGC 7320. 
So that one is the foreground galaxy at only 47 million light years distance. And then we have a couple others. Oops. Somehow that didn't work. this next picture to come in okay. and now so here's a couple of other galaxies so on the left the nucleus on the left is from NGC 7318 B 280 million light years away and the one on the right is from NGC 7318 A 320 million light years away we have down here in GC 7319 at 320 million light years according to Sky Safari Pro and we've got a foreground star here but right here is the nucleus of another galaxy at least I think that's a foreground star uh, NGC 7317 is this one right here okay then further afield, we have NGC 7320C. So this is 290 million light years away in that box. And then up at the top here, way up here where I'm putting the box around it, is another spiral galaxy and it what looks to be an edge on spiral NGC 7320A and there's not even a distance listed for that one but it's magnitude 15 and it's up there so hopefully that tour of these galaxies worked a lot better trying to point at it with a mouse that's not pointing in the direction that I see it on the screen. So yeah, I'm looking at the asteroid's coordinates. It doesn't even transit the meridian until 2 a.m. But it is up and rising, so that's good.
I tell you what, here in a second, as soon as we get this next image, I'm going to go ahead and stack what I've got, and let's just see where we're at on things. And I'll stack it with uh, July's images as well. So I did some stacking, now I'm going to adjust the levels a little bit, maybe do a tone map on it.
So I got the result. I'm going to save the processes that I used so I can reuse them. Alright. So let me show you the stacked image. Here is the result of the first stack. I tell you what, I'm going to crop it down to just well. Do I really want to? We do have other galaxies up there, like that e that edge on spiral looks pretty nice. But for now, I'm just going to crop it. see quite a dramatic difference in how much you can see in the stacked version versus the live image on the right. But there's still a good bit of noise there in the, in the image, which you can try using denoising algorithms, that kind of thing, to take it out. But Ideally, you want to be stacking more images to get even more signal. These are very faint targets, so collecting photons of light with the scope is the name of the game. Just letting that shutter run for as long as you can. So there we go. Some labels to go on things.
Oh. Oh, I'm not tracking the uh, near Earth asteroid yet, Kaiser Cube. But I will be later. We will be moving on to that next. Ah, it's a great question, Joseph. Joseph asks, so are 10 5-minute exposures the same as one 50-minute exposure? The answer is truly no, they're not really the same. And you can think of it like this. Um, if you do a 50-minute exposure, you're going to be potentially picking up things that are very, very dim, that only a few photons come in over those 50 minutes, okay? If you have low enough read noise and low enough thermal noise and all the rest, let's say that the camera's natural noise signature is very, very low, so that 50 minutes is actually useful, okay? You're going to be able to potentially pick up very faint signals that are only contributing a tiny signal, even in 50 minutes, above the noise floor of the image, of the individual image. In five minutes, that small signal might not be above the noise floor at all, particularly the read noise of the camera. So when you read out the image, there's a little bit of noise that's introduced called read noise just to do with the transfer process of the electrons from the pixel wells over to the analog to digital converter and all that kind of stuff and it reads out the the amount of charge on each each pixel but there's some noise involved in that process so if your signal if the amount of light you've collected and converted into an electric charge on the on the charge coupled device in this case the CCD could be a CMOS but in this case it's a CCD the amount of charge you've collected could be below the noise floor of the read noise of the camera and so when you go to read the image, you don't see that signal at all. You, it's just buried in the noise. And so, in theory, no matter how many images you stack, if that signal is too faint to show up beyond the noise of the image, you'll never see it. Oh, there's a plane or something. I don't hear it yet, but I definitely see it. Looks like a plane probably going to be flying over. Hey, maybe we'll get lucky and it'll go through the telescope and give us a nice looking UFO, right? pass through the field of view but uh, yeah so if you're doing just a five minute exposure just one tenth the exposure you're gonna have um, objects that don't contribute enough light to get above the noise floor of the individual exposure and so it's just buried in the noise and you'll never see it no matter how many you stack but certainly not ten uh, it's not gonna get the job done um, now, in practice, in practice, in a lot of cases, and, and certainly in my case where I live, it's there's some suburban light pollution. It's not pristine dark skies at my house, but it's darker than if I lived, you know, in the nearest city. But it's still, still got some light pollution to it on top of sky glow and everything else. And so that is its own kind of noise. And if I were to run a 50-minute exposure, I would just be amplifying that noise. I would just be getting more and more light pollution. The light pollution signal in the image would be higher, like the, the pixel value of that light pollution would be higher. So I wouldn't be doing anything useful, really. You would have just a single image with all the random noise that occurs in the camera, just from thermal noise and everything else, and you would have a brighter noise level just from light pollution and sky glow and all the rest so a 50 minute image in this camera with this telescope probably not a useful exposure setting 10 minutes yeah you might be able to get a little bit more if I did 10 minute exposures versus five minutes but there's a there's a give and a take to it there's a there's a balancing act in my opinion in terms of how many total images do you want to collect there is a usefulness in getting um, 
a dozen five-minute exposures versus only half a dozen ten-minute exposures. If you're just raising the brightness values of your of your natural light noise, your light pollution level in the image, you're not really doing as much as you could if you just stacked shorter, slightly shorter exposures where that light pollution value is darker in the image, but you're stacking multiple images to average out the camera's own random noise distribution over each individual exposure. So that if, uh, if you look at the picture I've got on screen on the left, you see all that colorful noise, the sort of graininess to it. That graininess goes away the more you stack. As I stack more and more pictures, that graininess kind of goes away. Now, the overall brightness of the picture, if I don't change how that picture is processed from raw data to a JPEG, if I did that the same way every time, the galaxies aren't necessarily going to get brighter. They'll be the same brightness. But the noise, the, the graininess of the picture becomes smoother. You, you smooth out that noise, you don't have as much noise in the picture. And so in that process, very faint things that might look like noise right now, that might be hidden kind of by that noise, can start to come out. And the image itself, in terms of the quality of it, ends up looking a lot better. So that's why it's important to collect multiple exposures. But it's a balancing act with the exposure length because it isn't the same as doing a longer exposure. But as long as your signal is above the noise floor, you can gain more by collecting more exposures without having to increase the exposure length. It just may take you longer. Um, but it, it depends. Like I said, it's a bit of a balancing act. Running a single hour-long exposure is not a good idea in general. Not to mention, I mean, just the complexities of that. If you have any any tracking misalignment, if the camera shifts at all, um, I mean, but we're talking by you know thousandths of a degree. If you get any flexure, anything like that, there's a lot of pitfalls that can go wrong in an hour-long exposure. Having to guide that, I mean. Uh, Astrophotographers used to have to do that back when you had film and you were doing things, you know, with analog media like that. You really did have to stack, you know, uh, or you didn't really have stacking. You had to, you just had to run the exposure for an hour because you had reciprocity failure too, what they call reciprocity failure, where film, unlike a CCD, does not respond to light in a linear fashion and the sensitivity would fall off a cliff very quickly during longer and longer exposure. So you had to keep adding on more light, more time, more exposure time to maintain a certain level of brightness to uh, get the picture that you want. And with CCDs, one of the major advantages of that technology as a revolution was that it didn't suffer reciprocity failure, meaning um, one photon of light should always pretty much produce the same charge on the pixels. One photon of light does not produce the same amount of change in the film media as you continue to add more photons. That's why it's called reciprocity failure. Your, your reciprocity for each photon is not the same over time. It decreases. And so a lot had to be done with film to hyper it, to increase its sensitivity with um, various techniques. You had cold cameras, you had um, ways that you had to expose the film to chemicals before uh, shooting your pictures. I mean, it was all a very complicated process. And that was just to try to get pictures that you could take that would look kind of like these <laughs> these individual five-minute exposures only would take you 50 minutes or more. It would take you an hour to do to get this kind, even what you're seeing on the live image. Um, so CCD's really changed the game there. Great question.
And so, just thinking back to that, like, I came onto the scene in terms of getting involved in astrophotography, started taking some very basic film pictures with a film SLR over 20 years ago. Um, and that was just with a eyepiece projection adapter and, like I said, a film SLR. But I wasn't doing deep space photography then. It was just uh, moon pictures, trying to get pictures of Saturn and things like that. And I, you know, I'd read in the magazines and I would, I would uh, hear from other amateur astronomers and stuff on the internet, like what they had to do to get these kinds of pictures. And it was just so, it was just such a steep learning curve, and and so much technology required to make it work at the time, like just the, the level of effort you had to do and the planning and everything else. And back then, a lot of it was done with what, what we call manual guiding, where you've got a secondary eyepiece that is uh, picking off a piece of the light or a flip mirror system, something like that, and you are looking at a star in the crosshairs of your eyepiece, usually illuminated reticle eyepiece or something like that and you would keep that star perfectly on the crosshairs um, for the whole exposure, for an hour. You'd have to sit there at the telescope, staring at the same star for an hour with your hand on the controller, trying not to make any mistakes. Because if you make a mistake, there's no going back. you got to start over. <laughs> or you just have to live with a slightly poorly tracked image. Not easy to do. Not easy to do. And uh, I've tried it once for charity <laughs> uh, did a light bucket challenge uh, getting a what turned out to be a fairly decent picture of the uh, horse head nebula but I mean it was manually tracked it was not quite as good as I could have done if I'd just done auto guiding like this it was a very difficult technique and uh, required a lot of concentration to do but these days you know with CCDs this CCD has actually two CCDs in it. One is the main imaging chip that's taking the, the pretty colorful pictures we see on, on the right, and the little small black and white picture you see that's rapidly changing up at the top is actually a secondary CCD that is specifically for auto-guiding. And it's looking at a star, it's doing the job that the human would normally have to do would end up with a reticle eyepiece, but it's doing it automatically many times a second. And uh, I've actually got an adaptive optics unit on here that is using a tilt tip mirror system to uh, keep that star perfectly centered. So it's tilting and tipping a mirror uh, as the method of moving the star around in the image as opposed to relying exclusively on the telescope's motors. So if we look at the auto guide tab there's a tilt percentage X and Y tilt and that's how tilted the mirror is, uh, how close to the limits of the mirror, uh, the mirror's maximum tilt it is in each axis. And if it gets too close, it will move the scope, uh, the scope's motors, but those are much more sluggish and slow to respond than the tilt-tip mirror system, which is basically instantaneous. And it's guiding, as you can see, a guide rate of about 2.3, 2.4 hertz, so it's making more than two corrections per second based on the position of that guide star using the tilt-tip mirror system. And when you're guiding that quickly, multiple times a second, uh, you can get some additional benefits more than just um, compensating for any tracking error of the motors, but also, to some extent, for some of the dis uh, displacement of the star's apparent position caused by atmospheric turbulence a little bit. Um, so that's, that's an advantage of the adaptive optics system. But even this system is not entirely bulletproof. It does um, require you to polar align the scope. Even if you're tracking perfectly on a star, if the scope is not properly polar aligned, you'll get field rotation. Because it'll actually require moving in two axes to keep that star perfectly centered. If you're perfectly polar aligned, you should only have to move in the right ascension axis in one direction, left or right, to compensate for any drive errors because you should be perfectly parallel with the Earth's rotation. And so because you're perfectly parallel with the Earth's rotation, 
the drive that turns in that direction should be all you have to do to compensate for any drive errors. The drive motor itself, the drive gear, is not perfectly round. It has some imperfection in its manufacture, and so some at some points in its rotation, it will turn a little bit faster or a little bit slower than it should, and that's why you have to compensate with guiding, even if you're perfectly polar aligned. Unless you have a very expensive scope with very expensively manufactured gears, which I do not. I do not have a scope that expensive. I mean, we're talking amount alone that would cost tens of thousands of dollars, usually. If you're at that level where you don't even require auto guiding. Um, mine is not that pricey. So, that's why we require auto guiding. But auto guiding is not a cure for improper polar alignment. If your polar alignment is poor or just not even done right at all, you'll get field rotation because you're actually moving in two axes and the whole field will appear to rotate around where you're tracking and so it'll smear the image in that direction. It's like a circular blur. And I've found that with this setup, with the adaptive optics unit, it's got this um, they call it a captain's wheel that loosens and tightens it against the telescope and you can loosen it to rotate the camera in order to find a guide star that might be at a different angle because the CCD that is doing the guiding is positioned up off the top beyond the top of the field of view of the main camera but it's a much smaller chip and so you may not find any suitable guide stars, any suitably bright stars in this tiny field of view so what you can do is you can rotate the camera It'll freely rotate if you loosen it slightly, and you can try to go find a guide star in a different direction. But even though I've got it tightened, unfortunately, under the force of gravity, sometimes it works itself a little bit loose, and it will shift the image very, very slightly at times. Um, sometimes if it becomes real loose, it becomes an even bigger problem, but if it shifts even by a thousandth of a degree, that's massive to the telescope at this scale, so you, you would start to notice that. Um, it does not take much uh, shifting of the scope to, to notice a problem. Have I seen the new harmonic drive mounts? Yes, with Envy. Oh yes, those look so nice. Yeah, these new new harmonic drive mounts that are supposed to be really accurate and very powerful that don't necessarily even require a counterweight system, which is bonkers to me. Uh, so if you look at a typical German equatorial mount, it's got the telescope on one end and it's got this big weight hanging off the other end that is supposed to perfectly counterbalance the weight of the scope and any equipment that's on the scope. Uh, but these new harmonic drives that they've come out with uh, for telescopes are supposed to be so good that unless you're running something really heavy, you don't even have to balance it, which is just crazy to me. I, I don't see how that's that's uh, a good philosophy, but I mean, it's just been beat into me. you got to balance your scope, you know. That's That's been the... Uh, standard thinking for a long time and that's that's been the case with uh, the way most scopes are engineered but apparently these, these harmonic drives don't require that necessarily so yeah it would be wonderful to have one of those they are supposed to be very accurate and all that um, I think it'd be a lot of fun to play with but uh, don't have the budget for it at the moment and you know, my personal interest in this hobby, uh, although I do enjoy deep space like this, my, my, my wheelhouse is more satellite-based tracking, which our harmonic drive system, with its accuracy, might still be uh, an advantage for. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not following conventional wisdom to begin with because I'm using a fork mount with an equatorial wedge with an old LX200 Classic, I mean, this this is a beater rig compared to what most guys are using these days. Same technology as industrial robots. Yeah, that's that's just crazy. That, that's awesome, yeah.
So I'm gonna go get a drink and I'll be right back. But keep an eye out for any uh, UFOs for me while I'm gone.
And I'm back. Did I miss anything exciting while I was gone? Sixteen collected, working on number seventeen. Tell you what, I'll run a fresh stack. Stacking 26 pictures total between the July images and tonight's. who don't know. The way this works is uh, these images are high bit depth. Most images you look at online or on the computer or take with most consumer cameras are going to be uh, 8 bit images. The brightness values range from 0 to 255. Um, that is not the case with these images. Now, I think the term high definition, or high dynamic range rather, high dynamic range, is probably better known now than it was even 10 years ago. People have HDR TVs, so this technology started to advance, but still, most content you consume Unless you're really watching, you know, something fancy, something, uh, you know, uh, on, I guess even Netflix now is starting to stream maybe in HDR in some cases. But with, the, with a few exceptions, most content is going to be 
standard uh, dynamic range or 8-bit. But these are 16-bit images. So the brightness values are basically range from uh, two, 0 to uh, 255 squared or 256 squared. Um, so they're 16-bit images. And so the brightness values are wider, much, much wider, exponentially so, than what your typical monitor can display. Your typical computer monitor is going to show you an 8-bit image. So you have to find a way to translate the high dynamic range into something sensible that your computer can display. And you can do this through tone mapping, which is pretty popular. And that's essentially what I'm doing here in the background. I'm tone mapping this image. Just trying to see. Just trying to compare for my own sake, my own sanity. What the apples to apples is like. Oh yeah, that's much better already with these additional images. The noise levels going down quite a bit. Okay, so I've processed the image exactly the same way as before, but now with more light, you're going to see less graininess. And this was, what was this? This was how many hours stacked? This was two hours, ten minutes of light. So let me pull that up. I'm trying to get them as close to the same size as possible, so when I blow this up to match the size, 
we'll see. Okay, so... Perfect. So I changed the, ro the rotational reference for the, the stack a little bit. It was set to July's rotation, um, but now it's set to now. But it's the same images, just more images. And notice, okay, this is one and a half hours. This is two point, uh, well, whatever. It's two hours, ten minutes. So a little less than two and a quarter hours. So even with just a little bit more data, we start to get a better image with less noise. Again, this is uh, 1 hour 30 minutes, this is 2 hour 10 minutes worth of light in 5 minute exposures each. I mean, we're even starting to pull a little more detail out in the structure of that galaxy on the top left there. I think that was 7320. Here it's just like you can't even really tell. It's it's there, but again, it's buried in the noise. It's just buried in the graininess. Now it starts the graininess starts to fade out, and you start to see much more detail. So I'm pretty pretty pleased with how that's coming along. is not 1.5 hours. This is 2.17 hours, roughly. Already, I'd say that's looking more like a cluster of galaxies rather than just a few galactic nuclei and some fuzziness. You can even see some more uh, clear, spi clean spiral arms. I agree. Yeah. I would really like to get this this final count up to three hours. If we get it to three hours, I think we'll all be pretty happy. That's about how much time I've done on my my Orion Nebula. I'm not a patient man, unfortunately, and I'm <laughs> I'm not great at when it comes to deep space photography for that reason. Because you got to be patient. I mean, you want the r the real good stuff. You want the best possible image. You you better have you know 12 hours of light on your image or more. I mean, that's that's when you start to get into real professional looking photos. But uh, I ain't got the time. <laughs> Just I don't have the patience for it. I should, I should just be more patient, just let it cook longer. But that means coming back over multiple nights, which technically I've done here, but the first night was just a quick, a quick and dirty one hour, and even getting into astronomical twilight, I, I omitted the last couple of images because the, the light level had been starting to come up on those because twilight was starting to set in. I mean, it was not ideal positioning for the object for observing with my telescope. And, uh... So I didn't get a whole lot of time on it, unfortunately. Uh, but I was just trying to get it done real quick before JWST released their image, um, and I did. But it was it was real, you know, real grainy, real faint. But tonight we're going to try to improve it as much as possible, so that we can really see some detail in these galaxies and compare it to the James Webb Space Telescope image. I'm pretty sure the James Webb is still going to win, hands down, but the point is to just show, yes, these galaxies are out there, yes, we can see them with an amateur telescope, and we can verify in broad strokes that the overarching shapes and details that we see 
in the James Webb images are the same as what we see uh, with regular telescopes on the ground, that we can confirm that these objects are out there. So we were at 26 light frames. To get to 3 hours, we need to get up to 36 light frames. That'll be uh, 36 times 5 minutes for 180 minutes. And that will get us to my goal. And now that's, that's between the July images and tonight's images. I'm just totaling all that up because I'm stacking everything. Um, so let's see, what did I have? I think I had 10 images from July that I, that I found to be useful. Maybe less. No, it was 10. Okay, it was 10 images. So if we get up to... Well, not quite. Uh, let's see. We don't actually have all that far to go. Looks like we need seven more images, not counting the one taking right now, or counting the one that we're taking right now. So once this comes in in one minute, we'll we'll just need six more images. So that's uh, thirty minutes. If we get thirty more minutes, we'll be we'll be golden, I think. If we can do that. Then, before we sign off, I do want to go over to that asteroid. Now, that asteroid is... it's already midnight. Okay, so that asteroid... Let's check on those coordinates. That's going to be... Yeah, 64 degrees high in the east right now. So it's getting on up there, but it's still still climbing. 1230 would be at 69 degrees and pretty well positioned for, for viewing in the theater. Now we're gonna like I said, we're gonna try Neo my new version of Neo Tracker, which downloads data from JPL live as it tracks. And we'll see how it does. We'll just see how it does. Hmm, need some rotation on that image. Ooh, the camera shifted. No, don't do that. I don't like it. All right. That might have to be an image I exclude just because there's, yeah, there's too much rotation in that image.
And just for fun, I'm going to add JWST's picture in here for reference. Okay, that's a little big. Let's shrink that down. Still a little big. <laughs> yeah. So JWST is powerful as heck, and the resolution on it is incredible. No surprise there, right? Now, this is going to be flipped. My image is actually flipped. My telescope inverts the images. So, let's see. If we do particle like that, yeah. And then we rotate. Roughly, I can only do 90 degree rotations of this thing, so it's not going to be perfect, but you get the idea anyway. It's pretty clearly the same cluster of galaxies, isn't it? It's just JWST's got a ton more resolution and uh, light gathering ability. <laughs> Because it's a gigantic, powerful telescope in deep space with infrared capabilities. But yeah, at the end of all this, I'll have a, a proper, do a proper overlay between the final image we get tonight and uh, JWST. comes the next image. Make it a good one. And that's still getting some rotation. Alright, I think we'll call it. Could just be the angle of the way gravity's pulling on this thing right now. That's fine. So, let me do a final stack. with 29 light frames. This will be 2 hours 25 minutes of light. And I'm going to give it all she's got. Heck, I'll even add in one of the images from July that had a little more uh, twilight in it, but probably still acceptable enough. will be a nice even 30 frames for two and a half hours of light.
think this is going to be even, even better. Now, obviously not as much of an improvement over the previous version, but still. And I'm going to pass this through neat image denoising for some final improvement. All right, here we go. Here is I'm going to bring in the final final version of our image of Stefan's quintet. Oh, that's beautiful. There you go, there, there's the final picture. And then James Webb for comparison. Oh, where did it go? James Webb, where'd you go? Oh, somehow I threw that to the bottom. Okay. Let's get that up to the top again. 
So yeah, clearly the same same galaxies, just uh, James Webb versus what I can do with my little amateur scope. Still, I'm pretty ha pretty happy with that. So, what we're gonna do now? is I'm going to have the scope go over and image. We're going to look for uh, the asteroid. So, give me just a second to reconfigure some stuff here. tracker get ready to go track the asteroid all right I put up my gloves again. My hands are getting numb. Confirm the identity of the asteroid after 2022 UC1. You know, it occurs to me, I'm going to have to plug the telescope into the computer first. 
So stand by, got to go do that. All right, moment of truth. Let's find out if this crazy thing works. First, let me uh, reconfigure a little bit with uh, OBS. We're gonna turn off. We're gonna turn off the uh, stacked images for now. Truth, we start and stop tracking. Here we go. Hmm. Okay, that's that's interesting. And by interesting, I mean it's not sending any commands to the telescope. <laughs> uh. Okay. Well, that's why we test, right? Did I not... Did I not get it to that point for the LX200? Maybe I just focused on... ASCOM development too much. I don't know. Oh, 
you should have. Yeah, it should be doing the thing that it's supposed to do. I think. just not going anywhere. Oh, I know what it is. <laughs> ah, yes. Oh, dear. Okay. I didn't foresee this scenario is the issue. <laughs> oh, yes. So, the issue is this. The telescope is polar aligned. That's the issue. See, I thought I was all clever and stuff. Modifying it so it would send out as commands to get around the uh, LX200 Classic's rather restrictive um, accuracy when sending right ascension declination. It's a long story, but my fix only works when the telescope is Altaz aligned, and when it's not Altaz aligned, it doesn't do anything, is what it doesn't do. <sighs> okay. Yeah, it's, the telescope is re probably receiving the commands, but it, it doesn't know what to do with that. It's like, what do you want me to do, buddy? I'm not in Altaz mode right now. Okay. So the question then becomes... Yeah, the question then becomes, can I just use the legacy mode on this version? I don't know. I guess I can try. Let's give it a shot. So that just means I have to not do things the new cool fancy way that I developed. Which, I mean, it's not the end of the world, but... By golly, it would have been nice if it had worked. So, instead, I'm just going to download the orbital elements and do things that way. And we'll see how well it does.
Okay. Well, it thinks it's doing something cool. Let's see if it really is. Because coordinates look totally wrong. Oh. Yeah, okay, well. Hang on. It, it probably. Probably. What I did there is probably not good. And by not good, I mean. I, uh. I kind of entered totally the wrong date. So I need to reload the orbital elements for an epoch that actually makes sense. And try again. Yeah, that was going to be quite a bit different. Okay, now I'm going to pull up the observer table for my location, and I'm just going to keep an eye on how we're doing on the predicted coordinates versus the commanded coordinates because the method I'm using to calculate the position mm, is not the best. It's not always the best. Sometimes it's, it's a few bit, itty bitty arc seconds wrong, which is definitely the case here. It's a couple arc minutes off. Maybe that's okay. Maybe it's not so far off that it matters. We're going to find out. Okay. So we're going to do... I'm going to do 10 second exposures. 2 by 2 binning. So bad, but uh, technically should be a bit few arc minutes. Okay, maybe not that many, but should be a few arc minutes above where I'm currently positioned.
for 30 seconds, really crank this guy up and see if we find anything. Dark frame. Try. I'm going to try moving around a little bit, see if I can find it. I know my slews were putting things on the upper right quadrant before. I might need to kind of undo what I did in declination for one thing. And just hunt around a little bit and... Oh, what do we have here? What do we have here? There's something there. That looks like it could be an asteroid in the just above the center of the image there. But it could be uh, just a star streaking tracking error kind of thing. We'll see in a second. Hey, I think we got an asteroid. I think we've got our asteroid. Apologies if the beeping is annoying, but that's uh, unavoidable. It's sending constant slew commands to the telescope. So yeah, we've got it. We've got our asteroid. It's uh, it's right here. I don't know if the box is showing up that well. It's gray on gray, but there, I put a little box around it for a second. Uh, it's really hard to see. I'll put a bigger box. Nah, that's not helpful. Put a littler box? <laughs> Like that. You can kind of see it there. A little symbol on it. And yeah, it's right in here. Tracked with Neo Tracker. So uh, you can get the source code for an older version of Neo Tracker on GitHub, on my GitHub. And uh, all channel members get exclusive access to pre-compiled executables of my programs, including Neo Tracker, Sat Tracker, and Rocket Tracker. So this particular asteroid, 2022 UC1. Uh, current distance from the telescope. Let's pull that up for a second here. Let's 
So it's currently 557,715 kilometers from the telescope. Which in lunar distances is 1.45 times the distance to the moon. So a pretty close pass by Earth. Again, it's right here, right? Right there. It's that one little dot. All the streaks are stars. The telescope is directly tracking the asteroid. And that's thanks to NeoTracker. Apparently my legacy features for NeoTracker are still working, though the new feature of um, using the internet to directly get the data in real time from JPL and just stream it directly into the telescope uh, I need to make a little refinement to it so that it's still compatible with the AUX200 Classic when it's polar aligned, which it currently is polar aligned and it is currently not compatible with the new feature. For whatever reason, and probably due to the limited computing power of the AUX200 Classic, which was designed and well, built in the mid-90s, uh, it does not know how to accept altitude azimuth coordinates when it's polar aligned. But that's the way the program's currently written. So I need, and I do have a feature in there where you can tell it what kind of mount that you have, uh, or what kind of alignment you currently have, whether it's out as or equatorial. But it ignores that for the LX200. It doesn't do anything at the moment. I need to finish writing that out and actually. <laughs> add proper compatibility for polar aligned LX200s because, you know, that makes sense. But at the moment, it's a very, very new feature that I'm adding for live streaming data from JPL. Instead, in this case, I've just downloaded the orbital elements and it's doing real-time computations based on those elements, but it's not streaming JPL data uh, directly into the scope. It's just doing computations based on oscillating elements. But it works. It works. We've got ourselves an asteroid here. So I'm just going to verify, yes, verifying that it is indeed saving these images in FITS file, so I can go back and process them later. So again, the asteroid is right where you, I'm trying to put a box over it and kind of make a little bit of a symbol on it right there. A little hard to see. It may be rotating fairly rapidly, so the brightness can vary over the course of its rotation, especially if it's a 
lumpy little thing with an odd shape. See, in that picture just now, I swear it got a little bit brighter. And these are only 30 second exposures. Kraken's looking pretty solid. It's holding steady. Now, in this case, uh, it's open loop tracking. It's just sending coordinates into the telescope constantly uh, and hoping that the telescope is pointing where it's telling it to point. And there's no evaluation of the stars or anything to determine where the telescope is really pointed to offset it. But you can manually push in an offset um, in arc seconds with the program. You just type in the number of arc seconds you want, the direction you want, and push northeast, south, or west, and it'll, it'll do that. It'll go there. So. But Rocket Tracker and Sat Tracker both have capability for closed loop tracking, so using video, live video to steer the scope. That's probably went right, sort of obscured by that star it was streaking by just now. Our asteroid. Right there.
Yeah, we got it, Kaiser Cube. We got ourselves an asteroid. Pretty happy with that. Something is bleeping desperately trying to get your attention. Yeah, that's the... I'll shut my mic off. That's the, um, the coordinates going into the telescope. It's issuing a very unending slew of slew commands, and uh, it's causing the telescope to beep repeatedly. There's nothing I can do about it. If I unplug the hand controller, it can cause the telescope's computer to freak out. So I'm just going to mute the mic and turn up the music for a bit, and uh, I'll be back in a bit.
Okay, I'm going to be shutting down here before too, too long. But, uh... I did put together a quick time lapse of about the first 45 minutes or so. Uh, I trimmed off the lap first couple minutes where I was just positioning it in the frame, but... Let me pull that up here and share with you all. Again, apologies for the beeping. Unavoidable. So, okay, this was not the version I trimmed, but nevertheless. So this was from the very start, and about the first 45 minutes worth of tracking there. And you can plainly see the asteroid there tracked while the stars are streaking by. I think that's pretty cool. But, hey, I'm biased. And if you prefer, you pull up you pull up the trimmed version that cuts off that first first couple minutes where it was uh, just me repositioning the scope. It kind of makes that look jerky at the very start of the uh, time lapse. But now this is a bit better, just trimming off the first uh, couple minutes there. You can really see how quickly that asteroid is moving relative to the background stars over about three quarters of an hour. Just flying by. I think Neil Tracker did a pretty good job tonight. And so did the scope and camera and all the rest. I'm pretty happy with these results. So again, we, we got uh, Stefan's Quintet there, as well as uh, Near-Earth Asteroid 2022 UC-1. too shabby if I do say so. But it's getting to be about that time. Time for me to tear down the scope and pack it in for the evening.
So again, I want to thank you all for coming and watching, and I hope you enjoyed the stream. Hope you enjoyed seeing Stefan's quintet one more time. I think I'm going to be done with that object for quite a while, but uh, now I finally got enough data that I'm pretty happy with the, the results. And I want to give a shout-out and a thank you to Tony Dunn for uh, giving me the heads up on this asteroid being visible tonight. Newly discovered asteroid 2022 UC1 flew by Earth at uh, just about 1.4 times the distance to the moon. So, I'm pretty happy about that. So until next time, thanks for watching, and uh, clear skies, folks.